Hi all. In this video, we're talking about the Fama and French three-factor model. This model was published in their 1992 paper, The Cross-Section of Expected Stock Returns. Before diving into the paper, let's first consider some fund management firms' characteristics. Many portfolio decisions made by index funds, mutual funds, and hedge funds, and actually really just mutual funds and hedge funds, are driven by three major risk factors, value, size, and the market. Typically, inve investors can gain access to specific categories of these factors by investing in low-cost funds that do not uh, take much management. Here are a few examples. So, for example, if you wanted access to you know, value or growth, you can buy Fidelity Blue Chip Value Fund or Fidelity Blue Chip Growth Fund, both of which are low-cost. If you wanted exposure to small stocks or large stocks, then you can buy low-fee Schwab U.S. Small Cap, small cap ETF or the Schwab U.S. Large Cap ETF. If you wanted exposure to the market, you can buy Spider S&P 500 Trust ETF. On the other hand, hedge funds aim to generate investment returns that are uncorrelated from the market size and value risk factors. And in this video, which you can watch on your own, uh, Ray Dalio, who's a brilliant investor and a brilliant manager in person, is going to explain to you um, the benefit of having 15 to 20 uh, investments that are uncorrelated from each other. And you can find this video by going uh, Ray Dalio Diversification or by searching for Ray Dalio Diversification on YouTube. Um, consider this example. Suppose that we need to pick 15 investments to construct an investment portfolio. Assume that we've identified two groups of 15 investments. All these 30 investments generate an absolute, absolute annual return of 10%. The 15 investments in the first group have a correlation with each other of 60%, while the 15 investments in the second group have a correlation with each other of 0%. That is, they're all uncorrelated from each other. By choosing the second group of investments, that is, those that are uncorrelated from each other, we can increase the total portfolio return to risk ratio by four times. By picking, that is, by picking investments that are less correlated with each other, we decrease the standard deviation of our portfolio and reduce our chances of losses in any given year. Just to recap, when picking investments to form a portfolio, it's beneficial to pick investments that are uncorrelated with each other and with the three factors that typically drive returns. Now let's discuss the paper in which Fama and French pr proposed their three-factor model. So first of all, what's the research question? The research question in this paper could be traced back to the capital asset pricing model, which was widely used to study and predict the return of an asset. Uh, CAPM used only one variable, and that is the asset's beta, the measure of an asset's systematic risk compared to that of the entire market and that was used to predict the return of the asset. However, some other studies found relationships between a firm's stock return and factors other than its beta, including its size, leverage, book-to-market ratio, and earnings price ratio. Moreover, some studies have found weak or non-existent relations between beta and average stock returns during the most recent 1963 to 1990 period. Thus, the research question was which factors, including beta, size, leverage, book-to-market, and earnings over price, best explain the return of stocks trading on the NYSE, Amex, and NASDAQ. The data sample of this paper included all firms in the intersection of the NYSE, Amex, and NASDAQ returns, files from CRISP and the merge CompuSet annual industrial files of income statement and balance sheet data. Firms in the financial sector were excluded from the data set due to their high leverage. CompuSet data from 1962 to 1989 were obtained crisp Stock return data were also obtained, and although CRISP only started uh, covering NASDAQ in 1973. Accounting data for all fiscal year ends in calendar year T-1 were matched with the returns for July of year T to June of year T plus 1. This gap between fiscal year end and the return tests was to ensure that the accounting variables were known before the returns were used to explain as sometimes companies do not, did not follow the SEC requirement to file their 10K within 90 days of fiscal year end. A firm's market capitalization at the end of year T-1 was used to compute its book-to-market leverage and earnings price ratio for year T-1, and its market capitalization for June of year T was used to measure its size. So now we're going to talk about uh, how Fama and French obtained beta data and constructed the size beta portfolios. All NYC stocks in the data set were sorted in June of each year based on market capitalization to determine the decile breakpoints for size. All stocks from NYC, Amex, NASDAQ were then placed into 10 portfolios based on the market capitalization decile breakpoints. 
This method of determining the breakpoints was employed because NASDAQ contained mostly stocks of companies with smaller market capitalization and would result in portfolios mostly filled with small stocks if NASDAQ was included in the breakpoint determination process. Then each of the 10 size portfolios was further subdivided into 10 portfolios based on pre-ranking betas for individual stocks. The pre-ranking betas were estimated on 24 to 60 month returns in the five years before July of year T. Similar to the size breakpoints, the beta breakpoints of the 100 size beta portfolios were determined with only NYSE stocks in the data set. After assigning firms to the 100 size beta portfolios in June, the equal weighted monthly returns of the portfolios for the next 12 months were calculated. This yielded post-ranking monthly returns for July 1963 to December 1990 on the 100 portfolios. Then the betas of each of the 100 portfolios were estimated as the sum of the slopes and the regression of the return on a portfolio on the current and prior month's market return. Table 1 shows the average returns, post-ranking beta, and average size of the size beta portfolios. Note that in panel B, the range of most of post-ranking betas was smaller, 1.44 to 0.92, for the 10 size deciles without consideration of beta within each decile, than the range of post-ranking betas across different betas within each size decile. This reflects the fact that the post-ranking betas were magnified when size beta portfolios were used instead of size portfolios. Also note that with each size decile, the ordering of the pre-ranking betas accurately portrayed the ordering of the post-ranking betas. Additionally, in panel three, the average size metric of each size decile was consistent across the pre-ranking betas. This suggests that the pre-ranking betas successfully produced variation in post-ranking betas that was unrelated to size. With respect to table two, table two presents various variables for portfolios formed on size and portfolios formed on pre-ranking beta. For both size and pre-ranking beta, the four most extreme portfolios, 1A, 1B, 10A, 10B, were divided from the top, from the bottom and top deciles, while the eight other portfolios followed the middle eight deciles. Panel A shows that portfolios from run size exhibited a negative relation between size and average return, as well as a positive relation between average return and beta that was predicted by CAPM. By contrast, panel B shows that portfolios formed on pre-ranking beta did not exhibit a clear relation between average return and beta, which verified findings in previous literature that there was no relation between average return and beta from 1964 to 1979. Now, reconsidering results presented in Table 1 helps clarify the results yielded from Table 2. Namely, that there was a positive relationship between average return and beta for the portfolio formed on size, but no relation between average return and beta for the portfolio formed on pre-ranking beta. In Table 1, Panel A shows that average returns remained fairly consistent or slightly decreased with increasing pre-ranking betas within each size SL. In both Panel A and Panel B of Table 1, average returns and betas both decreased with increasing size. This is just that variation in beta that was tied to size was positively related to average return, but variation in beta unrelated to size was not reflected as a trend in the average returns from 1963 to 1990. The ultimate implication is that the size and average returns were related, but there was no relation between beta and average returns when controlling for size. Table 3 presents the time series averages of the slopes from the following Macbeth regressions of the variables used to explain average returns. The factors are size, beta, leverage, earnings over price, and book-to-market equity. The average slopes provided by provided standard Fama Macbeth tests for determining whether the explanatory variables on average had non-zero expected premiums from July 1963 to December 1990. The monthly regressions included 2,267 stocks on average. Size had explanatory power on average stock returns. The average slope from the monthly Fama McBreath regressions of returns on size alone was negative 0.15%. This negative slope persisted when other explanatory variables were added in the regressions, with the size slopes always around or larger than two standard errors away from zero. This indicates that the size effect was prominent from 1963 to 1990. The size effect was that smaller stocks had higher average returns than larger stocks. On the other hand, beta's slope from the monthly regressions were not as robust. The positive 0.15% slope from the regressions of returns on beta alone was only 0.46 standard errors away from zero, and the beta slope turned negative at only 1.21 standard errors away from zero when the size variable was added to the regressions. 
In addition, Fama and French reported that beta had no explanatory power on average returns in Fama Macbeth regressions that used variation, various combinations of beta with size, book to market, equity, leverage, and earnings to price. Book to market equity has a strong relation with average returns, with the average slope for the monthly regressions of returns on LN book to equity over market equity alone being 5.71 standard errors away from zero. In terms of the leverage variable, A over ME, this served as a measure of market leverage, while A over BE served as a measure of book leverage. Their average slopes were all significantly away from zero, but market leverage had positive slopes, while book leverage had negative slopes. This conflicting phenomenon could be explained by the fact that the difference between market and book leverage is book to market equity. The average slopes of book to market equity were close to the absolute values of the book leverage and market leverage slopes. Overall, Fama and French concluded that the book to market equity effect could be reinterpreted as the leverage effect, which was captured by the difference between market leverage and book leverage. In this table, Positive earnings to price applied to companies with positive earnings, while the earnings over price dummy was one for companies with negative earnings and zero for companies with positive earnings. Thus, firms with negative earnings had average returns that were significantly away from zero, and firms with positive earnings had positive relation between average returns and increasing earnings over price. However, the earnings over price dummy slope became close to zero when the size and the book to market equity factors were added to regressions. Additionally, the positive earnings to price inclusion and regressions did not substantially alter the average slopes of size and book to market equity factors, which suggests that the relation between positive earnings to price and average returns was likely due to a positive relationship between earnings over price and the natural log of uh, book to market. Fama and French also formed portfolios on book to market equity and earnings to price. Note there were only a few sample firms with negative book equity values, and they were excluded from the tests. Portfolios formed on book-to-market equity exhibited a strong positive relation between book-to-market equity and average returns. This observed relation could not be attributed to beta as the post-ranking betas remain relatively consistent across the 12 book-to-market equity portfolios. Portfolios formed on earnings price ratio exhibited a U-shaped trend in average returns with increasing earnings price ratios. This is consistent with existing literature on the relation of earnings over price and average returns. Table 5 shows the average monthly returns on portfolios that were first sorted on size and then sorted on book-to-market equity. Average returns increased with increasing book-to-market ratio within each size decile. Average returns decreased with increasing size. Thus, Fama and French concluded that a size effect and a book-to-market effect persisted for average returns after controlling for the other respective factor. In other words, the size effect persisted when controlling for book-to-market equity and book-to-market equity effect persisted when controlling for size. Remember that Table 3 shows that in the cross-section of stock returns from 1963 to 1990, size had a negative premium, book-to-market equity had a positive premium, and the average premium for market beta was close to zero. Fama and French extended upon these findings in Table 6 by regressing the three factors above with or without beta. They also divided the time period of the stocks into roughly equal subperiods. Beta did not exhibit a strong relation with average returns in either subperiod. Book-to-market equity exhibited a strong and consistent relation with average returns in both subperiods. Size also exhibited a negative relation with average returns, although the relation was not quite as robust as the relation between book to market equity and average returns. Previous literature has demonstrated that the size effect was stronger in January than in other months. Similar to this size January effect, Fama and French found that book to market equity had average January slopes that were twice those for the other months, and the book to market slopes remained robust throughout the year despite the January anomaly. So that concludes uh, this video on the Fama French three factors. I hope you found it helpful and I'll see you in the next video.